So welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, the second webinar on the COVID crisis. Uh, today we are welcoming Nelly Lang, who will talk about the financial stabilization efforts of the United States, and especially what the central bank is doing, the Fed, and also the Treasury. We're very glad to have her with us. Nelly Lang is currently at the Booking Center, but before that she was the Director of Financial Stability Office in the Federal Reserve Board. And she worked to the right hand of Ben Bernanke. She essentially all the financial stability efforts went through her desk. She's an expert and there's probably nobody who can tell her more about the current e efforts the Fed is undertaking to stabilize the economy. So before, like last time, I would like to give some few, few remarks and then we will move on and uh, Nelly will take over and will explain the various programs and the implications and the aims of the policy measures. Like last time, uh, I mentioned the crisis has three elements. So first it concerns the health of the people, the real economy and the financial markets. And on Monday, we will have another webinar with uh, Ramanan, Laksima Ramanan, who actually is an expert on disease dynamics. So he has a PhD in economics, but also a PhD in health. And he will talk on Monday, same time as now. And then we will go more to the real economy. Olivier Blanchard, from the former chief economist of the IMF, will talk on April 6. And today, Nelly will talk about the financial markets and the instabilities and the efforts to control the instabilities. What you have essentially, whenever we have this huge shock currently coming on the real side of the economy, unlike in the previous crisis where it came from the financial side, we want to understand the shock, the dynamics of the shock, and also importantly, the amplification effects the feed, because of feedback loops, spirals, non-linearities, the switch from a risk on to risk off uh, environment, the flight to safety and all that. Now, I just want to illustrate these amplifications and how policy can mitigate this amplification. So typically when markets face small or medium sized shocks, financial markets can handle these shocks and they're self-stabilizing. So we, we have here what we have in the blue curve, that's the GDP initially, then there's a shock and it's, it's a temporary shock and it comes back to the old uh, level. I did render that. And typically financial markets help out to smooth these shocks out. So essentially the fundamental shock you observe is actually then smaller than the actual shock, which is the blue one because the markets smooth things out. However, when you face large shocks, it is the case that the financial markets freeze and the whole system becomes destabilizing. So instead of self-stabilizing, it becomes destabilizing. That's one element. So we have dropped way below the fundamental shock because markets make things worse. Amplification, liquidity spirals, and other um, feedback loops come in play and make the thing substantially worse. And on top of it, you have a long run impact because the liquidity problems which are temporary problems morph into solvency problems and they are lead to a permanent depression essentially of uh, the GDP level. And the aim of the policy is to reduce this amplification and also make the long run impacts less dramatic. So that's what we want to understand today, what, how the various measures help uh, to mitigate uh, these amplification effects and liquidity spirals and so forth. So when we talk about liquidity, we obviously have to have two different concepts of liquidity in mind. One is funding liquidity and the other one is market liquidity. Funding liquidity is about the primary markets. How can you issue some new loans? How can we originate new loans? How to get funding to the various people or institutions who need some funding? This might be firms, this might be small and medium enterprises, this might be financial firms, but this might also might be market makers. So who might help to make the market uh, when you want to buy certain debt claims in the market later on. And that leads us already to market liquidity. While funding liquidity is about the primary markets, market liquidity is about the secondary market. Once these debt claims are issued, you have some claims, you might want to sell them in a the secondary market to somebody else who is more able to handle it after a while. And market liquidity reflects a bit ask spread and volume and the secondary market. So that's essentially the two liquidity concepts and they will show up in many of these programs. But what happens typically when 
the market makers don't have enough funding liquidity that don't provide market liquidity anymore. So the market making service is impaired. So the funding liquidity problems lead to less market liquidity. And because of less market liquidity, that feeds also back to less funding liquidity. And we saw this in US treasury market, which is typically the most where the funding liquidity is for the US government. And then there's a lot of market making going on that's used as a collateral and, and so forth. And it's the market liquidity was drying up that makes funding liquidity more difficult and it feeds back in many, many markets. You have this liquidity spirals uh, having a play. So like last time, I want to show this slide again for the students that we have the stock market, of course, but here we will focus very much on the credit and funding markets. Who wants some funding, the governments, the business and households. And of course, there are some funding channels which focusing very much on capital markets and shadow banks. And we have the repo market, it's collateralized lending, we have money market funds and the market making as I mentioned before. So all of these elements are focused very much on capital and credit markets and the shadow banks are very active. And then on top of it, we have the regular banks which give standard loans to SMEs. Or, and then there, some of them have more opportunities to give land, loans and others have more deposits. So they have extra funding on the balance sheets. So there's an interbank market where they interact with each other. So these are the two ways the US funding market works. In the US, capital markets are very, very important and banks are important, especially for small and medium enterprises. In other parts of the world, in Europe and in Japan, the banks are still much more important than the capital markets. Let me just stop at the last, uh, say a little bit that, you know, the Fed's activities is very much focused to get the capital markets approach going again. And as some observers said, oh, but you know, that might not reach the small and medium enterprises. So I proposed a proposal with Arvind Krishnamurti where we promote evergreen. And essentially we have to rethink, we have to inverse our policy prescriptions. The do's or don'ts are reversed right now. So I have this nice picture where everything is upside down when you walk through the street. In normal times, we want to avoid, regulators make very, work very hard to avoid evergreening because zombies essentially crowd out the funding for new firms who are more productive. So you constantly fund old firms which are not productive and evergreening is actually very bad for the economy. But now we actually have to promote evergreening in order to maintain this social capital and the capital which is in various small and medium enterprises and other firms. So we have to think 180 degrees the opposite. And that's you know what we try to outline here, why we have to think so radically different from previous times. So all of with this little remarks, I would like to pass it on to Nelly. She will now take over the slides and continue outlining various uh, programs of the US government and in particular from the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, which should help to mitigate the push and the amplification effects, reduce the amplification effects, which typically will be at place without any help from the government. So Nelly, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Marcus, for asking me to join today. I'm glad to be here. Um, as Marcus said, I'm going to focus on the financial stabilization policies. I want to do a couple things. Um, put these in the context of the other responses. Um, describe to some extent what has been done already and then what more could be done. So that will be my structure. Okay, so Marcus, I am not going to the next screen. Um, there we go. Thank you. Okay. okay. So here is um, just an outline of the broad uh, program. So of course, first, structuring the official response to the COVID-19, the first piece has to be health. Um, obviously, you need to control the spread of the virus. And then there are the pieces that are economic. So the fiscal uh, is an important element. Um, as you know, there's a $2 trillion legislative package called CARE that is about to be voted on. I would say that um, some of it is relief for households. I highlighted that there is $370 billion set aside for small businesses in an SBA, the Small Business Administration Framework, and then a $500 billion fund for businesses 
and the Fed would have some of that capital available to support lending. Um, just to put it in contrast, that was $700 billion for TARP in 2008. Um, on the financial side, monetary policy obviously can take actions and typically the central bank response to any kind of adverse shock like we had here is to cut interest rates. And they've already cut twice and now they're down to effectively the zero lower bound. On financial stabilization, um, the Fed had to start acting much earlier than the legislation. In some sense, financial markets don't wait. You know, They need to be able to price risk and there was lots of uncertainty. So the markets got very illiquid and concerns about um, being very dysfunctional. So the Fed had to take a number of actions. And I would put those mainly under emergency liquidity provision and I'll talk a lot about those. And then they are setting in place some, pr some proposals to keep the economy from um, sort of the downturn from being worse so that it's re in a position to recover very, very quickly. Um, I'll also talk a bit about a couple of macro prudential policies, which is new since 2008. What's different from this recession or this downturn in shock versus the last one is that the source of the risk is really ex exogenous. Um, the last 2008 crisis, it was in the financial sector. There was difficult to uh, respond to that because you didn't want to reward the financial sector that had actually gotten you into this problem in the first place. So there were other issues that came across that made it more difficult. So I think we're moving quicker here. So as I mentioned, the approach is different from 2008 because the crisis originated in the financial sector. And I would say so far from the financial stabilization side, it has been much more aggressive from the start. And the goal is to support credit and market functioning. Um, the similar goals though, of course, is to limit the damage to the economy and then to position the economy to recover more quickly once the pan pandemic recedes. Um, as Marcus outlined, um, why liquidity provision? How does that help? It helps to prevent the liquidity stress from becoming uh, insolvency. And um, it can also be a bridge to government transfers or other solutions about how to arrange the sharing of the costs of the pandemic. Okay, so uh, here's a chart. Um, we just recently um, finished a book in February 2020 called First Responders which documented all the programs that were done in the 2008 crisis. And this is a visualization. So we finished the book in February, not anticipating that it would be actually, would need to be used so quickly. And so I have to say, I've been referring to it fairly frequently lately. What this does is separate at the top. So the, along the horizontal axis is time. So you can see the very first action is a monetary policy action. And then you have the central bank starting with central bank swap lines, but also at the top, you have um, some discount window and then a bunch of what I'm gonna describe as 13.3 facilities, but you can see they just get introduced over time. And most of the policies in 2008 are these systemic policies. You have some monetary policies, you have some housing and autos and you have international. But this is just a visualization this time I would say uh, the start is even been more aggressive. Okay, so just to, yes, Wendy, yes, Marcus. Can I ask you a question? So there are some questions here from John K from the CBO. He wants to know how CARES would be working and how will it operate and do you have any background information on that? And then there's also a question about negative interest rates. The Fed cut, you mentioned the zero lower bound. Is there any hope for it that they will go negative? Yeah. Or is this not yeah. the call for the United States. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so on the, on the first question about how these will work, I'm gonna go through that in some detail if I understood that question right. If not, just tell me again. Um, on monetary policy, obviously they have taken steps, they're at zero. Um, I think Chairman Powell has laid out his view about what the likely framework for monetary policy would be going forward. Um, prior to this episode, prior to having hit the low, zero lower bound. 
So I think the first, there are two tools that I think they're starting to think of as conventional. One is asset purchases and the other is forward guidance. Um, and those would be used in the United States almost certainly before they would go to negative rates. They have not suggested that negative rates is something they think would work very well in the United States. But one never, you know, I doubt they're taking it off the table, but it is not either one or two on their list. But I think they have some room for um, forward guidance and quantitative easing. Okay. So let me mention, um, just as background, the authorities for the Fed to provide liquidity to markets. Um, the Fed ha can purchase U.S. government securities. Um, and so it can, it can just buy them. Under 13.3, which is used when the Fed is determined unusual and ex exigent circumstances, um, they can extend credit that is secured to its satisfaction, which they have determined to be, they really can't take a loss on it because they don't have the authority to spend taxpayer funds. So they can lend, um, so they can take collateral to protect themselves. Um, the security can be provided by government capital. That's the role of the treasury and where potential legislative um, capital could come or fees and other features of the program. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act added some additional restrictions on 13.3. Um, the lending needs to be broad-based, which means it cannot be used to support an individual failing firm. Um, and any use of 13.3 requires approval of the Secretary of the Treasury. And currently, Treasury is, um, has been approving all the proposed 13.3 facilities. Okay, the way the Fed can intervene, just a little overview still, um, again, it can purchase assets. If it purchases assets, the Fed carries the risk, but it can only purchase government securities, which means treasuries and agency securities. Um, it can repo, which means it can, which would lend against collateral. It carries little risk, it sets haircuts, so it loses only if the collateral values fall too much. Um, and it can determine what kinds of collateral and against from whom. Um, it can lend, but it can only, it cannot lend directly. Um, it can lend or has chosen, I should be a little more careful about that. It has chosen not to lend directly. It lends to an SPV funded by capital from the US fiscal authorities. And the US treasury will always be in the first loss position in those cases. And then, um, then there are some macro prudential tools, which I'll talk about at the end here. Just an, slight, a little overview of all the asset classes that one could imagine. And I'm doing this just to help um, set up why current is different from um, 2008. So it purchases US Treasury securities, agency debt, and agency RMBS. Last week, it extended to agency CMBS. So that's new, it's not a big market. Um, they have the authority to do this, they can purchase. They can repo with primary dealers. Um, can you explain CMBS? And yes, please. Doctor, excuse me. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So um, CMBS and RMBS, these are pools of mortgages. So the RMBS is residential mortgages that are originated and guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie um, and would also include FHA mortgages. CMBS is commercial mortgages pooled, also guaranteed by Fannie or Freddie. So it's a much smaller market than the residential mortgage uh, space. Um, the Fed has never purchased them, but they can because they are government guaranteed. Um, they can repo with primary dealers against a broad class of securities, including corporate bonds, asset-backed securities, such as credit card, backed securities, auto loans, um, small business loans. And in 2008, a large part of the repo they ended up doing included the private, 
the private residential mortgage-backed securities, such as the subprime mortgages. Um, so that was one way they took off some of the risk out of the private sector. Um, and then they can lend through a number of, through an SPV and um, facilitate issuance in the commercial paper market, either unsecured or in the asset-backed CP market, which was very large in 2008. Um, they can lend and new issuance for asset-backed securities. What is new this time, and they've already rolled this out, they've announced that they will, is corporate bonds. That is something that they had not um, done last time. Also municipal short-term credits. And then a question mark here because they have not provided any details yet, which is the small to medium size enterprises, but they have announced what they call a Main Street program. So I'll talk a, some details about that. But yes. Can you ask what are the respective merits between asset purchases and the repos when the objective is to provide liquidity to the market? How would you compare purchases versus repos? Right. So they can repo against a lot of collateral that they cannot buy. So because they can only buy treasuries, government securities, that they cannot buy the corporate bonds, the ABS, the private RMBS, those securities. So their only choice is repo. Um, so they can do term repo or they could create a facility with primary dealers who could bring this collateral. It's, it's similar. So that's, that's something that by the Federal Reserve Act, they cannot purchase private securities or municipal securities. If you compare it with the ECB and the Bank of Japan, would you say it's a major difference? Yeah, so the, the Bank of Japan has broad author, authorities to buy a broad range of securities. They buy equities. You know, they buy ETFs of equities. The ECB can buy corporate bonds. Um, they can buy sovereign bonds of countries. One might think of some some like the US can't buy municipal bonds. So the US authorities are much more limited, much more limited. Does that answer your question? What the merits? Can you give us some evaluation whether you think it's good or bad? Um, that the I think are more it, limited? Um, yeah, so I, in my view, for the independence of a central bank, you benefit from restrictions on what you can purchase. And if, for example, um, you know, it's difficult to figure out which bonds to buy, which private sector bonds to purchase. Um, you have pressures from state and local governments to purchase their bonds, when actually, in some sense, that really should be the role for Congress to determine it's more fiscal. If the Fed buys and has, to, and some one of those issuers becomes troubled and needs a workout, the Fed doesn't really want to engage in, you know, lo, uh, working out a loan in a new agreement. So I think there are some advantages to it. I think they've been able to um, help with new issuance and help with secondary market liquidity through these other types of facilities they've created. So I would be in favor of it, but I, it does reduce flexibility in certain times. So Greg Nini from Bechtel asked, you know, but this is through the SPV, isn't the Fed essentially buying it? I'm sorry? Isn't the Fed essentially buying it through the SPV? So because the SPV buys corporate ABSs and money. Yeah, yeah. So the SPV is capitalized with, um, government capital, and then Fed lending. So for example, one of, the new fee, one of the new programs for corporate bonds includes $10 billion of capital from the treasury and 90 billion of lending from the Fed. And the treasury is in the first loss position. And then between that capital plus the fees and the particular spreads and conditions they put on the program, the Fed can lend secured to its satisfaction, which is required in 
in the legislation for what they're permitted to do. So it's not. Last quick question on this. Yeah. Um, who is controlling the SPV? Who has what the corporate governance? And is it equivalent, effectively, this corporate bond purchase to risk they ask? So is it is the Fed also controlling the SPV, or is who is running the SPV, or is it run by the Treasury? It's run by the the collateral is valued by the Fed because they need to ensure it's secured to their satisfaction, but the ultimate owner is the treasury because they're the equity holder. Is that, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, some of this has to do with every central bank and every country works under its, you know, existing authorities and they find ways to provide liquidity to the market. And um, I can go into some details about each of the facilities, but I, this is trying to give a big picture of like, which markets can they try to touch in given their limitations and, and the needs. So the needs now are different than the needs in 2008. Okay. Um, let me just start with, they were able to do some things very quickly right up front and that's asset purchases and repo. This doesn't require any specific 13.3 um, um, determination. So the goal, and this is separate from monetary policy, this is to support mon market liquidity and ensure the transmission of monetary policy. So they can purchase and repo US government securities, treasuries and agency securities. So they initially announced they would purchase $700 billion of treasury and agencies, and they offered to repo 1.5 trillion. Um, after about three days, it was clear that the repo wasn't working that well. And on the following Monday, they announced that they would purchase 375 billion in treasuries and 250 billion in agencies in that following week. And they also expanded to include the agency CMBS. And they stated they'd purchase more if needed. And just to give you a sense of how big all this is, the Fed balance sheet from September 2nd, 2019 has risen from 3.8 trillion up to 4.7 trillion as of March 16th before these facilities were announced. So it's, it's making, there's been some move already. Um, Central banks typically can offer discount window. Uh, they've lowered the rate, they've extended the maturity and they're encouraging banks to use the discount window. So they pledge collateral um, and can borrow against collateral on their balance sheet. They're saying the financial strength of the banks now versus in 2008 should reduce the stigma. So they're hoping that banks will actually use the discount window. Um, Explain the difference between discount window and a repo collateralized lending. And then a question came in from Sermon Bungor, uh, whether the corporate bonds will be available for secondary lending once they said as part of them. Would the corp, okay, so the first the one is the discount window and what's the question, Marcus? Just contrast the repos and the discount window, both are collateralized lending. Yes, yes. And what's the difference? Um, the disc, that's a great question. The discount window is open only to commercial banks and the repo can be open to um, dealers, primary dealers. So the US, the other piece to which I, the other, the thing about the United States is the US central bank can provide discount window support to the commercial banking system. It cannot use discount window type lending to primary dealers, but the US has a bank and a huge market based system. And so their, their, their limits are, are, um, are way, in this case are way too restrictive because they can only provide funds directly to a very small for only a portion of the market. So this is one thing I think um, could be expanded, not the collateral, not the quality of the collateral, but their reach. Because as we know, bonds and things, they go through dealers and not necessarily through traditional banks. 
So the two things here are just trying to get traditional standard lending out, one discount window to commercial banks, and the PDCF, the primary dealer credit facility, is kind of trying to get discount window lending to the primary dealers. Um, and that was used in 2008, and that was very, um, that was very successful. Um, the other thing I would mention is in 2008, they were fairly timid when they opened to primary dealers, limited the collateral that they would take, basically to treasuries and governments. And then by the time Lehman failed in October, they expanded it to a broad array of collateral that um, is standard in the tri-party market. This time, the first time they announced it, they just said they would accept all collateral that's accepted on the tri-party platform. Okay, um, short-term credit markets, I'll just mention this quickly. The short-term funding to corporations, they use the commercial paper to manage their cash balances. Um, so they reintroduced the commercial paper funding facility, which basically offers three-month papers, to very high-grade issuers. There's limits on how big it is. The Treasury provided $10 billion in capital. Um, the Fed can lend up to uh, $90 billion on this. I expect with the current legislation, if, um, if they want, they could put some more money in this. They extended it recently to municipals, short-term municipal bonds, and that reflects some problems in current tax-exempt money market funds. Um, they also created a fund, a facility for money markets. Happy to take questions about it, but this one gets a little technical. Um, okay, so this is sort of the new thing this time, very new. Um, they've extended into corporate credit. And as I mentioned earlier, they're not allowed to buy corporate credit, um, but they wanted to provide liquidity and support market functioning in this space. So the sort of design principles of creating an SPV for this um, is you want to create rates and terms on these facilities that are more expensive for the issuer than they might get in normal market conditions. So you set a little bit higher rate. You do, and the idea is to incentivize firms to go back to the markets as soon as they can. But there are certain conditions aren't great right now. This gives firms an option to go to this facility and issue. Um, there are two facilities. Uh, one facility is new issuance, one is secondary market. So the primary market corporate credit facility, um, each has $10 billion in capital from Treasury and um, lending from the Fed up to uh, of, 90, of 90 billion. So the primary market is if you're an investment grade corporation and having difficulty issuing a new bond or a loan in the market. You can issue a bond or a loan to this facility with a maturity of up to four years. The amount cannot be greater than the amount based on outstandings in the last year. Um, if you borrow and you defer your payments for six months because of the current crisis, you cannot also pay dividends or buy back shares. Um, so this is in line with the way the current legislation is, which is any firm that wants to borrow using capital from the new legislation, they can defer payments, but they cannot pay dividends or buy back shares. And if you're willing to commit to retaining your employees, some businesses might be able to, um, that loan might actually be forgiven. But this whole, this whole package this year is really designed to support companies so they can retain their employees. They're really trying to preserve the employer-employee relationship. So most of the funds that are being made available are conditioned on things like this, um, terms like this. Um, some yeah. questions from uh, the audience. The one is, uh, would the Fed be willing to buy non-investment grade bonds as well? And if uh, and if uh, Wissing Jurgensen from Berkeley, 
And then it's a question by Howard Snyder, essentially what happens if the bonds are downgraded? What will the Fed do then with the, yeah. with the bonds? Yeah. Those are terrific questions. So currently, um, they, have they have said they are not purchasing below investment grade bonds. You have to have a rating of investment grade at the time the bond is issued. Um, so it's not expanding the whole market. If it is downgraded, that's a fascinating question. And the term sheet has not been clear yet about what it does. Um, the ECB, I believe, once it's downgraded, it's sort of shifted off to another vehicle and somebody, and it's managed elsewhere. But they take it off um, out of their original pool. But they purchase it on their balance sheet, so they do it a little differently. But currently, this does not help the um, high yield bond market or, or leverage loan market, which I know people have raised questions. Um, there are some questions about consumer ABS and, and how will this be treated, this SPV on the, on the Fed's balance sheet? Is it similar to the PPIP capital in 2008? Yeah. So this is more like um, the CPFF of 2008. It is just a, um, what's that? The Can commercial paper funding facility, yeah. but it's instead of three month commercial paper, it's four month bonds and loans. Okay. And um, it will not, there's a different facility for um, the ABS market. The TELF, which was created in 2008, they've also relaunched that for some specific um, ABS securities. That's usually new issuance. They might try to address legacy issues, but they haven't um, stated that they would do that. So right now, the Fed has generally just gone in at new issue and have not tried to go into, but they did announce this thing called the secondary market corporate credit uh, facility, which is going to purchase existing investment grade bonds and bond ETFs in the secondary market. They, this, this particular program also has $10 billion of capital lending from the Fed. They are hiring an outside um, asset manager to execute this program. There are limits on the size of particular bonds. They have not stated in public anywhere how they will choose what to buy. And this has been always been one of the issues and it's not so clear yet what the purpose of this facility is in the long run. So about these two facilities, uh, David Beckworth from Mercantil's uh... Center wants to know whether they're justified on the 13.3 or the legal justification for these two new facilities. Is it 13.3 yeah. or? Yeah, these are 13.3 facilities. There has to be a determination that um, uh, there are unusual and exigent circumstances. And so there is a memo somewhere to determine that credit conditions are um, unfavorable, difficult for businesses to borrow and which would hurt the real economy. So there are, I'm sure, memos to support the creation of every one of these facilities um, to meet the determination of unusual and exigent. Okay, if I answered all the questions so far. Is there a... just one more question yeah. concerning about moral hazard for next time. Does this, yeah. do these facilities create moral hazard for next time by the Yeah, okay. that's... Um, I think that that's a uh, also just is a is a very important question. I think it's a a question of um, of limiting the losses. It's not going to prevent lots and lots of losses from being taken, but it might limit them, and it might limit them for those who. Um, sort of the innocent bystanders in some sense. So if they offer very generous terms, um, that definitely would encourage 
moral hazard, but my guess is there will be some extraction of costs from some parties um, to implement these. That was even more of a problem in the 2008 crisis where there were particular financial firms that there was very a real concern about you don't want to um, reward the firms that got you here. Um, this is their sort of broad markets and it's in uh, non-financial investment grade companies who normally are able to access bonds and CP and all of a sudden can't and they want to maintain their payroll. So um, that's the idea. And it is short, it is not meant to be long-term. So, okay. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say about corporates for now. Um, macro, I'm gonna mention a couple macro prudential policies because in 2008, this wasn't possible in the sense that the financial sector was much weaker. And so um, you would not, they didn't have capital or liquidity buffers to use. Um, so since the crisis in Basel III, banks have built up capital and liquidity buffers and the Fed has actively encouraged banks to use their capital and liquidity buffers. So they don't have a counter cyclical capital buffer, some countries do, so that can't be lowered. But many banks have what they call management buffers, which are above their current capital required by regulations or the stress test. Um, banks voluntarily announced they would re reduce share repurchases through the second quarter that also increases their buffers to absorb losses. Um, that's not a trivial amount. Um, although they only announced through the second quarter, in 2019, eight banks, um, their share repurchases totaled $100 billion. So you can cut, that's in the context of the legislation of $450 billion for lending. So if they actually reduce their share repurchases, there's a fair amount of capital there. Um, it isn't clear how banks can use their liquidity buffers. That's a piece of the post-reform legislation that has never been totally clear uh, whether liquidity buffers can be used. And so there's some pressure on the bank regulators to um, design and make clear to banks, if you have access to the discount window, can you reduce your liquidity buffers? Um, the other piece, um, they did was they issued guidance last week to banks to work with their borrowers that are affected by this virus. And what that means is you can defer payments or extend maturities for up to say six months. And you would not have to classify that loan modification as a troubled debt restructuring. And the reason that's important is then you don't have to incur a capital charge right away. So this is, so this is in some sense, people get very worried about, is this about keeping zombie firms alive? And, um, you know, and just delaying the inevitable, but the regulators thought that if it really is a COVID-19, these, small businesses, these households are being asked not to work or to close their doors. Um, that, isn't, that isn't a sign about their financial condition before this virus hit. And so this is designed to just allow a bit of time. It just allows a bit of time either for stimulus, for some relief from the government um, in the form of uninsurance or you know, direct checks, but it just gives every, it's a little bit of a pause in some sense. So that was, um, that was issued just this week. And I think they're still trying to make sure they understand when this would uh, apply. But those are two macro prudential policies that were, that have been used. Is this, yes. Can we, so Virala Charia had this proposal out there to extend the 90 days for nine, another 90 days with some bars and regulation. Uh, is this in the same spirit? Um, if they were to extend 90 days and then choose to extend another 90, 
and it's then not counted as non-performing loan. Yeah, yeah. I think if it's a if it's a, because of COVID nineteen. Yeah. 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 There will have to be some documentation, I'm sure, um, but I I think they said up to 180 days. So I think they could do that in small pieces or all at once or, yeah. Okay. Um, I did wanna talk about small businesses. Um, Marcus mentioned that usually the programs the Fed does are kind of capital market based and through dealers and they don't reach the small businesses. Um, I think there is a view that small businesses have been a, you know, especially hit hard this time. So when they announced the programs for the corporates, they also said they would introduce a Main Street business lending program. But they did, and they said they would expect to announce it soon. And so there are no details. Um, the goal, however, is to support lending to small and medium-sized businesses, which are going to complement efforts that are in the current legislation CARE to provide loans to small businesses eligible under Small Business Administration. So Small Business Administration is businesses under 500 employees. The Fed's programs would try to reach um, companies where with 500 to 10,000 employees. The lending will, that's, can be allowed using that capital from the legislation would require that firms retain employees for the first six months of the loan. And it might only be a six month loan. It might be a short loan. It's an interim loan. It's to kind of bridge um, until the economy starts to recover again. But there's a lot of um, questions about how to do this. Um, you, you need to rely on banks because they have this relationship with their customers. Um, how do you incentivize them to do this? Um, how do you protect the Fed? Usually, for example, they've only gone down to investment grade issuers. So a small business loan um, has a much higher default rate. And so there are a lot of design issues that they are working um, hard on. I think Marcus's and um, Arvind, Arvind's thing about rolling over existing or even rolling over short new issues under this program is a real viable option, it seems to me. Um, it'll probably, it could probably be just banks, but it's possible that non-bank lenders might be able to access, be able to do some underwriting for this program. Um, it'll be a very important program, it'll be very hard. Um, one can imagine at the at SBA, you can forgive your loan under certain conditions, these loans cannot be forgiven. So you have to design them for small business borrowers to take on debt at a time when they can't pay their current bills and not like impose excessive debt burden on them at the end of the process. So I think there's this balance of offer them a loan, but don't make it where it's not possible for them to repay it. Um, so those are some of the more interesting design dimensions of this one. I think it'll be fascinating. So I'm going to use this last slide um, um, to illustrate. This is a slide. This is a, so this is a positive slide. Um, this is from to demonstrate the outcomes of some of the facilities from the last crisis. So let me just show you what this is. So this is uh, 2007 through 2010. And the black line is monthly GDP growth year over year. The blue line is employment year over year. And the shaded spaces are the various dollars used in various facilities of the crisis from the chart I showed earlier. So the darkest blue are the dollar amounts 
totaling close to $2 trillion at its peak of liquidity provided by the Fed. And it was very small through 2007, then it went up to 2008, and it peaked in Q4 2008. Um, the next blue is the actual TARP dollars. That's the capital so the Fed could lend. Um, the next shade of blue is some other programs. And the light blue is uh, the guarantees on bank debt and deposits. But the point I want to make is you can see where GDP and employment really fall very quickly. The current expectations are that it could fall even quicker in this episode. Um, um, this is, I think, in Q4, there was GDP growth of minus 8.5% um, annual rate, I believe. And so currently, I think those numbers are in the minus 20% range. But it turns out very quickly. The recovery is um, much faster than I think people appreciated. Um, and I think it, you can see some of the facilities and then the facilities start running off very uh, soon um, in mid 2009. So that's my ending slide to say that, you know, we can end on a positive note. <laughs> there, there are numerous questions. Uh, let me just group them together. So one type of questions are more about the macro potential uh, aspects and there's yeah. a whole a bunch of questions concerning the facilities. So let me first, uh, so say Luis Pietro eventually, he asked, how do you compare the programs for the SMEs in Europe with the United States, where in Europe, for example, Spain is providing some guarantees of 80% of yeah. private loans for SMEs. Would you say the US program is more aggressive or the European or Spanish program? Do you have any comparison across the countries, France, Germany, yeah. UK, Italy, and Spain compared to US? Is there any, yeah. is it too early to make any comparison at this stage? I, it's, a little, it's a little early. I know a few distinctions. Um, different countries, again, depending on the kinds of authorities they have over the actions they can take and what is sort of acceptable in their society, um, have taken different approaches. Um, in the UK, which is one that I do know, um, they have for small businesses affected by this virus, they are offering 80% of wages for the workers. And the rest is to be worked out between the banks and borrowers. So they're just covering 80%. So it doesn't even involve the central bank. Um, they also have a funding for lending scheme, which goes through the discount window and basically is a preferable borrowing rate through the discount window if you lend to small businesses and you can show that your small business loans have grown. So they have a different way of getting there. Um, the US could use their discount window. It's may not reach, we, the US has a bigger non-bank sector than the UK. So you have these trade-offs. Um, and I think we actually don't know yet which one's gonna work better. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm that, I, I'm not that familiar with some of the other programs right now. I'm trying to learn more about them if you wanna send me some information. <laughs> uh some questions are also Mariana Bolonusu from the Bank of Canada asked, is it better to directly lend to SMEs or via the bank? What the thinking in the Federal Reserve, you know, which approach is more fruitful? And uh, Lorian Keller asked, uh, given that this was an exogenous shock and the earlier one was more an endogenous coming from inside the system, do you expect the recovery will be quicker and not so long lasting compared to the last crisis? Yeah, okay. Um, on direct lending, the, um, the US has about 6,000 community banks. And the view has been that small, that community banks and small businesses have relationships and they understand the business. Um, and currently the current programs that are being designed are building on those relationships that the government would not be in a position, a new lender, government or somebody else would not be in a position to evaluate 
the quality of a lender. And so I think they're trying to speed the underwriting up in the sense of if you would have made a loan to this business on January 1st, 2020, you that qualifies that you can extend a loan and that would qualify for, you know, reasonable underwriting standards. But I do think they believe that the relationships are very important and there are so many small businesses that you really have to rely on your existing infrastructure to get the money out. Um, on the recovery, I absolutely agree that the view is the economy didn't have big structural problems. There will be some things to fix when this is over. Um, someone raised some moral hazard issues, but fundamentally it, you don't have to restructure the, the core of the financial system or the economic or the, you know, the real economy. So the goal is to reduce the size of this downfall so that everything can just recover very quickly. I mean, and we'll, that's the goal. Um, I, I think, I don't see why, I mean, there will be some lasting, if you don't sever all the employee employer relationships that can come back more quickly than if you, those all break down. Um, but so much will depend on how this virus plays out. And to the extent you think, you know, even if the shutdowns are lifted, how quickly people will want to get back out. Um, but I don't think there's anything on the financial side or the structural side that should impede the recovery a lot would be a big impediment. Yes. We close with another four questions, which are more based on the different facilities, uh, the funding facilities. Okay. So Mohammed is asking, um, how is the Treasury, the U.S. Treasury funding itself, the equity plan? Are right. there issues on U.S. Treasury? There's issue essentially also debt to the citizens. Yes. Yeah. And Todd Keister from Rutgers uh, asks whether, you know. What's the interpretation about the reform of the money market fund system? Was it a failure, the reform which was adopted in 2014? Or are we much more sound now, but we have to essentially pay out the money market fund again? And Sermon Gundor from the Bank of Canada asked, uh, how do you price the corporate bonds which are bought by the Fed? And then Jay Vipra from Troll Bond Rating Agency asked, the secondary facilities are in are they aimed to help portfolio investors? A portfolio? What, who is the primary target you want to help? So these are the final four questions. Okay. Um, the US Treasury equity piece is, is capital paid for by the taxpayers. Um, the TARP capital was a $700 billion pool of capital funded by taxpayer money given to treasury and the Fed lent against it. And I would just a reminder that the TARP capital, all the investments um, were repaid except for two. One was related to the General Motors auto company restructuring and two were a lot of loan modifications for homeowners. And it was designed not to recover that money. That was basically a subsidy all the financial uh, parts of the package were repaid in full plus. So on, it was a transfer from taxpayers to the financial sector for a while and then repaid. Currently, um, the current package has a lot of stimulus or relief, which is to individuals in this form of unemployment insurance and, and relief. That's a taxpayer choice. That's trying, how, do, how are you going to share the costs of this virus across the whole economy? Um, the lending for small businesses might well be also a subsidy because that can be forgiven. The $500 billion lending facility, the $500 billion of capital could be like TARP. So it could be used to leverage lending. And one piece that one of Marcus's earlier charts illustrated was if you can lend you might be able to, this is the liquidity to bridge. You might be able to reduce the size of that downturn. You might prevent certain things from breaking. 
So it improves the probability that you get to a good outcome at the end versus a bad outcome. So it might be what viewed as costly early might actually end up being less costly later because you get the, cover, the economy back on track. But you're exactly right. Treasury capital is taxpayer money. So this is very um, important. The money funds. Um, so I think, I think um, there will be a lot of soul searching on money funds when this is all said and done. The reforms in 2014 required the prime money funds to float their NA NABs for institutional investors, but retail and tax exempt, the municipal money market funds could still offer a fixed. In this crisis, investors wanted cash. So it, we're, I think there will have to be a look at whether it was the fixed versus floating that caused the run to treasuries and prime money funds, or if it was just, you're going to move to cash, whether or not you're fixed or floating. I think it raises fundamental issues about whether you want any money funds with any kind of um, that doesn't have some security like all treasury securities to exist. Um, so I think that's going to be um, a big topic when this is, that's one of the issues on the agenda as soon as this is over. Um, but I would say that the MMLF is designed to purchase the commercial paper and the municipal bonds that are held in the prime funds that were having difficulty because the investors redeemed. Um, how to price the corporate bonds? Um, I think in the new issue market, it isn't, it isn't that difficult. They learned how to do commercial paper the last time. This is, has the same features. If it's a new issue bond, um, you set a price which is above normal times, but lower than stress times. Um, you, you know, there's a limit, there's, it's limited to investment grade, there's a limited maturity, um, not that concerned about it. You have to think about what happens if one of the investment grade bonds gets downgraded, if the, you know, if the recovery, if the recession is longer than expected, but um, that one isn't so difficult. On the secondary market, I think as I mentioned early, it was much less clear to me what the objectives of that facility are. Um, they've never done a secondary market facility um, first. Well, they've never done corporate bonds and then they, but they haven't done secondary market in some sense either then. Um, they have not clear, they have not defined publicly what the objectives of that facility are except to promote market liquidity and support market functioning. So I think we'll learn a lot more when they set out the terms for people to see um, what that is. And they are using a private sector manager to make, to help execute that program. So I, again, I don't know enough about that and it's very new. So um, I think those are the four questions. Is that right? Yes, thanks a lot, Nelly. I'm really very grateful for illuminating us and um, it shows deep knowledge and expertise you have uh, in all these programs and all the objectives and a very professional approach uh, you put to day here. So thanks again and thanks to all of our participants here. I think it was a very informative uh, session. We all learned a lot and uh, we stay in touch. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.